So this lecture will all be about instrumentation and control. By the end of the lecture, you should know what variables we typically control in bioreactors, and what are the sensors that we use for it, and what's the feedback loop associated with it. So why is this so important? So as we've seen before in bioreactors, it's very important to maintain optimal conditions. So whether that's temperature, whether that's pH, because most of these microorganisms are a lot more sensitive compared to um, your, what you have in your standard reactions. So even though bioreactors tend to be slower, uh, there needs to be a tighter level of control because once your population of microorganisms is dead, or maybe you have mutations, then there's no hope of recovery for what you're doing. Now, particular issues that we'll touch upon is sterilization. So what happens to kind of the probes that you insert? How do you need to treat those? And also we're looking at that it will have a large impact on where you actually position these probes because it will give you different types of information. The, the sensors that you're using will depend on what type of bioreactor you have. And a big discrimination there is between uh, your anaerobic or aerobic reactor. So what you actually need to monitor depends on what kind of operating mode you have. So whether that's batch uh, versus continuous. Um, and then there's also the aspect that you have your typical sensors. So like you would have in any reactor, so like pH, temperature, and then bioreactors are actually uh, dealing with biomass. You see um, your typical bioreactor. Now, what was kind of standard, you would have your pressure sensor, uh, you would look at the impeller speed, you would look at the temperature. And as I said before, the dissolved oxygen, that's quite like an important one for bioreactors. And you would often see that there are multiple oxygen probes. The pressure has an impact on what oxygen level you measure. So that would mean you would get a different va value if you measure on the bottom of the, uh, the vessel compared to the top. Now, other typical sensors, as I said before, relate to carbon dioxide and the foam, which is measured on top of the vessel. Typical requirements for sensors. So if you would have your optimal sensor, what would it be? And the first thing, it needs to be precise. And precise talks about if you would take, for instance, six different uh, readings, would you get the same value throughout the six different readings, or do they tend to vary a little bit? That's accuracy, and this relates to whether the value is true or not. So imagine if you might be uh, measuring something, for instance, uh, in the reactor and your probe starts fouling. So what then happens is that you consistently measure a different value compared to what you would actually have in the reactor. So the value would be lower or higher compared to what you want to measure. Yeah? And sometimes what you would need to do, you would need to recalibrate your sensor in order to uh, improve the accuracy. Then there's the sensitivity. So sensitivity, if we're talking about a medical test, then we're looking at whether a patient would have a certain disease or not. When we're talking about it in the aspect of bioreactors, it talks about how much the signal changes uh, as a function of, for instance, oxygen or whatever kind of thing you want to measure. So the higher uh, the slope is, so the higher the change in the signal upon changing a variable, it means the more sensitive your measurement would be. Now, other practical things are the reliability. So this has to do with whether you get failure of the probes or whether you might get alarms where it doesn't work and just general practicality. How expensive is it? How easy is it to clean, for instance? Might it break? And you will see that this is actually quite an important aspect as we'll show you your typical sensors and bioreactors. I always thought this was quite like an interesting diagram to show because a lot of people mix up what precision and accuracy is. So something can be highly accurate, but if it's not precise, you can see that it's spread out all over the place. On, on the other hand, it can be very precise, but not accurate, which means it's very off from the target. And this one is relatively uh, easy to correct for, because you might have like some kind of model where you would implement a change in order to get it to the accurate uh, value. So you would see, for instance, filing of probes over time, recalibration, uh, that's very important get accurate readings. Now, in an ideal scenario, you would obviously have uh, high precision and high accuracy, but just bear in mind that this is not always the case. Now, what is important in the, the sense of the nomenclature that your sensors measure over different time scales. So in a bioreactor, first of all, you can have offline measurements, which uh, is you take a sample from a reactor, you bring it to the lab, and within several hours, you get your results. So you will see this is mostly done for very specialized measurements. And if the, the growth in the bioreactor is quite slow, then this is an important aspect.
An example of ad line measurements where you get the results in minutes is, for instance, gross chromatography combined with mass spectrometry. And then what is quite common is when you do uh, online measurements, you actually divert the sample from the re reactor using something which is called flow injection analysis. The most challenging aspect is actually doing in situ measurements, which means that the probe measures directly in the reactor. So as you can imagine, in a bioreactor, there's lots of particles, there's liquid, there's gas, so there's a lot of uh, common interference. So you might need to do some modeling when you do these type of measurements. So temperature is an important one pH is important and dissolved oxygen and mainly dissolved oxygen is different for the bioreactors here. So what are kind of the type of requirements you have for your sensors then? So they need to be quite robust so they shouldn't break easily and also they should be able to withstand sterilization because you don't want any uh, bacteria to basically affect the sensor so they need to withstand high temperatures for sure. And ways of how you can get around this you can have some protection on the sensor so you could for instance have like an outer membrane because bio uh, in bioreactive reactions tend to be like on a slightly longer time scale there are a lot of measurements that you can actually do online or at line uh, and these are typical processes like for instance monitoring uh, biomass so the cell growth and cell viability, where you don't need to necessarily every second know what's happening. Either online or atline measurement is flow injection analysis. So what happens in that case, you divert the sample from a reactor using a pump and it's compatible with every type of a measurement. So literally the only thing that it is, you have a pump, you inject your sample, you might have some pretreatment of the sample. So think of, for instance, filtration where you're removing your particles. And then it's important to note that the sample you take doesn't go back in the reactor. Yeah? So that's a potential disadvantage because they discard it. Now, another way of preventing this type of contamination that I was talking about is using aseptic sampling. And aseptic sampling uh, often involves at least one O-ring, usually two of them. So you really separate out the interior of the fermenter and the outside. And you can use steam uh, to actually clean those, so you sterilize them in between. But the O-rings make sure that you really seal off the reactor. Now, what's the most common problem here? People not replacing O-rings. Yeah? So if you work with that kind of principle, which is very good to prevent contamination, they need to maintain uh, quite on a regular basis. I'm going to talk about three uh, typical techniques that are used in the reactors uh, and to begin with the pH measurements. So I think you all know from the lab how pH measurements work, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. Uh, but bear in mind that when you do this, it's fragile equipment. Yeah, so it's made out of glass, so that's something to take care of. And it always contains a reference electrode. And like with lots of these sensors, you need to make sure that this reference uh, is appropriate. So it also involves calibration and maintenance on a regular basis. Now what's the feedback um, mechanism with this? Well, in this case, it's relatively straightforward. You set it to a certain pH level and which is uh, best for uh, growth of your microorganisms. And then if you're above or below, you have like an inlet in the reactor where you can feed in acid or base, and that's how you control it. The next one uh, relates to dissolved oxygen, because as I said, obviously you need to make sure that there's enough oxygen to, uh, for the cells to grow. Um, you don't need to know all the details of this sensor but just what type of process it is and why it's important. The galvanostatic tends to be like it's slightly outdated and you're probably not going to see much of it, uh, but your typical uh, sensor is the Clark sensor and the Clark sensor is a voltammetric method. Uh, so it involves a reduction and oxidation reactions. So it looks at uh, the current in order to estimate how much oxygen there is in the reactor. Now, the the big disadvantage is with measuring this way, even though this is by far the most common standard, is that you can see if you look at the reaction, is that you consume oxygen in the process. And as we all know how precious oxygen is in bioreactors, that can be a drawback. So there are like some novel ways that are being developed, uh, which involves, for instance, other impedometric methods, so other electrochemical methods to do it. Uh, in this video, you can see why optical detection is also an interesting alternative. When it comes to spectroscopy, there's quite a number of techniques that we can use. So mass spectrometry is often used for gas analysis, 
Uh, and this is particularly possible because oxygen is a paramagnetic gas, so it's attracted to a magnetic field. Because oxygen has a symmetrical structure, you can't detect it using infrared. So even though carbon dioxide is symmetrical as well, you have non-symmetrical structures. So that one um, you can actually pick up with infrared spectroscopy, which is more often used because it's lower cost than using mass spectrometry. Now, near-infrared spectroscopy is also uh, used to determine certain sugars, so the nutrients that we use, or amino acids or metabolites uh, that are used to monitor microbial growth. What it can also be used for is for quality analysis. You will see particularly in your MNG we have an example where we use it to look at a tablet. And we can also, if there is a recombinant protein products, particularly if they have a green fluorescent label, then we can use optical method to detect those and monitor the production in that way. However, the problem with all of these techniques is that they are high cost, they're difficult to calibrate, and this becomes because in a bioreactor you've got many other interference and you might need to model uh, to correct for these interference. So in summary, what should you have learned from this lecture? So first of all, your typical classification of sensors. So we're looking at offline, a very specialized analysis, taking a long time towards like the in situ where you directly measure within your reactor. You should know that aseptic sampling is very important to avoid contamination. And you should be aware of what type of uh, sensors we use in bioreactors, such as, for instance, pH. And besides the sensors, you should also know the feedback me mechanisms that are associated with those sensors.